Human Rights, White Bears, and Correct Legal Spelling of Dostoevsky. Попробуйте задать себе задачу. Не вспоминать о белом медведе. И увидите, что он проклятый. Будет поминутно припоминаться. What I just read was a quote by the Russian author Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky from his book Winter Notes and Summer Impressions, written in 1863. Most people will agree that Dostoevsky was a great humanist writer, but that is, it seems, also as far as our common humane understanding goes. When Dostoevsky travels beyond his own cultural sphere, and is translated, for instance, to other letters than his own Cyrillic ones, there's no real consensus about how to spell the name of this great writer. Some will write Dostoevsky. Others will write Dostoevsky. And yet others will write Dostoevsky. But it is not only Dostoevsky who is keeping us apart. And any word, whether it's Cyrillic or not, is always at risk of being misunderstood, falsely interpreted or spelled wrongly. If one should take Dostoevsky to court, the letter of the law about this topic of correct legal spelling could probably also be understood and interpreted, interpreted in a confusing variety of subtle meanings. However way one would spell it though, what Dostoevsky actually said was that if you try and set yourself the task not to think of a white bear, the cursed thing will come to mind every minute. So the moment you decide not to think of a white bear, it will then get inevitably stuck on your head, in your head. I am a superficial white bear, and as such a living proof that white bears may not, be ne not necessarily be as deeply stuck inside as Dostoevsky once thought. I am a superficial bear with a superficial snout and superficial knowledge, who since 2009 have successfully proved Dostoevsky wrong by actually managing on several occasions to go out of my mind and come out onto the surface. On these occasions, I have, among other things, been investigating how I, the private inner bear, has had a profound effect on many important outer aspects of society and public life. That also includes the very public concern of law and order, which is what I will be dealing with today. I will do so because I have high hopes that my exit from the depths of the mind and my entry onto the superficial surface of things can potentially ease the challenge it has been to humane lawmaking that I have been roaring and roaring inside humanity for the last 150 years. in a bear that you cannot not think about demonstrates nicely the problem that everyone, even the freest of minds, are not completely free to think for themselves. In the court of law, 
this lack of free thought should be taken into account and the possibility that a given perpetrator may have been subjected to some inner beast at the time of a given crime and is thus not entirely free and responsible for his or her actions must be frequently considered when passing judgment. Some crimes, it seems, can even be excused and be legal if they are committed under the pressure of such gigantic inner roarings. One of those rules that can, that can make something that is normally illegal acceptable is, for instance, the inner law of culture that bids people to act in a certain manner because their forefathers have done it for generations and because it is, is thus rooted deep in them through their culture to do it. Dostoevsky's mind experiment was part of an argument that was to explain how there is a seemingly inevitable difference between, between Westerners and Russians, exactly because they seem to be under the influence of each their own partic particular kind of cultural roaring. The white bear stuck on the mind is an example of the cultural code within us, with, within us all that makes us act in certain Russian, Western, Chinese, Nigerian, Egyptian, Australian, Swedish, Luxembourgian, German, Swiss, English, Somali, Indian, Vietnamese, Mexican, Aboriginal, Canadian, or Arctic ways, whether we want it or not. If the law would decree, for instance, that, oh, sorry, <laughs> in the Canadian news service, thestar.com, Luli Tomasi, who shot his first white bear at the age of 12, explains why certain people will even have to break the law if it should come to this come to the point where the law would be in disagreement with their inner cultural roaring. If the law would decree, for instance, that Luli Tomasi and his people could no longer hunt white bear, they would quite simply have to do it anyway. First, the article explains. For thousands of years, Inuit hunters have stalked polar bears across the Arctic, killing animals they revere to keep themselves and their culture alive. And Luli Tomasi adds that we will kill anyway because it's in our culture. We need, to hunt po we need to hunt polar bear meat. Once we haven't eaten it for a long time, we miss it. Just like if you haven't eaten st steak for so long, you miss it. and diversities of roaring that make some people so desperately crave steak and others polar bear meat are an enormous challenge to anyone who may fantasize of a common humane letter of the law under which all are equal, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, fur color and ways of spelling Dostoevsky. were to be treated equally before the law, one would, for instance, have to rule that either everyone or no one should be allowed to shoot white bear. That is, however, not what has been ruled in this matter. Instead, it has been decided to grant a very small part of humanity the exclusive right to shoot the white bears with the argument that they've done it always. In 1973, so-called contracting parties <clears throat> which are Norway, Denmark, Canada, USA and the Soviet Union made a bare agreement in which local people, <clears throat> which is probably uh, indigenous Arctic peoples, were granted a so-called traditional right to shoot, to shoot the white bears, even though no one else were allowed. Article 3 in this agreement states that subject to the provisions of Article 2 and 4, any contracting party 
may allow the taking of polar bears when such taking is carried out, a. by local people using methods in the exercise of their traditional right, or e. wherever polar bears have or might have been subjected to taking by traditional means by its nationals. So it seems that the principle that is weighed in this Arctic agreement is the principle of first come, first served. In other words, the first person on the ice gets the most white bear, and such a tradition-based their first principle does indeed seem quite reasonable when you first think of it. However, <coughs> one could also argue, <coughs> with just as much good reason, that those who have always shot white bears have already had their turn, and that it is about time that they let others have a shot. There are, as it appears, many cumbersome and arbitrary considerations to take into account when trying to write a law that is fair and equal to all. Everyone roars with their own tongue. Dostoevsky is spelled and pronounced in a great many variety of ways, and in every letter of the law there's an inherent possibility of being interpreted differently than intended, no matter, matter how much effort one may have put into finding that one precise rule. To call Inuvia Lut from Canada, Nunatse Lut from Labrador, Inupiat and Yupik from Alaska, Kalalit from Greenland and the Siberian Yupik from the Chukchi Peninsula in Russia for local people with traditional rights and the states in which they are locals for the contracting parties is also <clears throat> not so precise that it is beyond risk of being interpreted differently by different people either. My interpretation is, for instance, that those contracting parties who decided to call those Arctic people for local people with traditional rights may have had a kind of embarrassed fur in their mouths that made it difficult to coin one simple and suitable common term with which to describe the peoples of the Arctic. Maybe because the words they had at hand <coughs> seemed to reopen old embarrassing tales about abuse and discrimination perpetrated by those uh, contracting parties. It probably seemed that neither the old Norse word skrallinga or the widely used term Eskimo was really acceptable. Skrallinga was a name that was first given to the Arctic people by Norse newcomers. Today it means something like a person who's weak or sweep. The widely used term Eskimo is also considered to be pejorative in many Arctic communities today. The word Eskimo was probably first given to these so-called locals with traditional rights by the neighboring Mi'kmaq people. There has been an abundance of theories as to what the word Eskimo actually and originally means. Some believe it means the one that laces a snowshoe, others that it means the one that eats raw meat, and yet others again believe that it may mean the one that speaks another language. And speaking of, and in, another language, in 1980, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, an organization that represents 160,000 locals with traditional rights, decided to change and challenge centuries of linguistic habits and call themselves, and demand to be called, Inuits. The word Inuit derives from the Arctic language Inuktitut and translates into people. <clears throat> the word people derives from both Etruscan and Latin and should then in principle translate into Inuits. In the word for people, 
which should ideally encompass all of humanity, the inner animal seems to roar on about its annoying old tale that people <clears throat> have such very different inner roars that equality between people is really not a possibility. Even though both Inuits and descendants of Etruscans and Romans are all people, and even though people translates into Inuit in Inuktitut, it seems strangely absurd when one tries to call people who live anywhere else than in the Arctic for Inuit. Even though you are probably all people, <clears throat> and even though Inuit means people, I doubt that too many of you here will consider yourselves to be Inuit. That some can thus only be people in the territory in which they are born, and others can be people anywhere in the world, is of course basically unjust and a problem for any grand hope that there could be some common humane basis for humanity on which we, one can build the idea of an equality before the law. But there are some languages whose word for people has no space in them, commonly humane, thus make it somewhat difficult to imagine some common humane letter of the law, at least if one wants to write such a law with the words we have at hand today. At the moment, however, the situation in the Arctic is that temperatures are rising and nothing is as, sol is as, sol as solid as it once was. In this new flooding, everything, your bear and my bear, and the ways in which we spell Dostoevsky, suddenly get mixed up and become fluent and fluid in new and surprising ways. In 2006, for instance, the big game hunter, Jim Martell, shot himself a surprising trophy. A white bear that on a closer look turned out not to be white, but brown. Martell, who only had permission to shoot white bears, faced a thousand dollar fine and up to a year in prison for this mistake. When the bear was more closely examined, however, it became evident that the bear was actually neither brown nor white. Instead, this dead bear turned out to be a Howie hybrid, a mix of two species of bear, a grizzly and a polar bear, later to be called a pizzly or a roller. Whatever these hybrids may be called, it seems to be a phenomenon on the increase. Since Mattel shot his hybrid in 2006, Two similar cases have been reported and shot. Some believe that this growing multichromatic mating activity may be taking place because white and brown bears that will usually cross the ice during the long Arctic winters suddenly find themselves unable to return to where they came from because of unexpected early thawing. When bears cannot return to their own country like that, it will of course greatly increase the chances that they will meet up with other bears than the ones they would normally meet. As the mating patterns and anatomy and chemistry of brown and white bears are very similar, they will of course be likely to meet and have cubs together. It also seems that this hasn't caused any particular biological or social problems, and apparently these two not-so-different bears are able to raise well-functioning offspring that will hunt seal if their mothers hunt seal and eat salmon if their mothers eat salmon. Some even argue <clears throat> that because of this, we shouldn't worry so much whether or not the white bear will go in state in case of climate change as it seems that the bear will just adapt to new conditions, change diet and take on a color that will fit better to the landscape that turns up underneath the ice. Some hardliners, however, will probably argue for the frozen forms of yesterday and speak hotly in favor 
of some deep, original and real bear. In spite of the fact that everything seems to be more free-floating these days, such traditionalists will probably say that there can only be one proper way in which to spell Dostoevsky, and be of the solidly frozen conviction that adaptable bears with uncategorizable fur are just, as, are just shallow creatures who can hardly be called real bears. This frosty view on unknown fur may also be the ice cold reasoning behind the fact that Mattel and other big game hunters can shoot these creatures without being prosecuted. If Mattel's mistake had been that he had shot a brown bear, he would, for instance, have gone to prison. But when it turned out that it wasn't a real bear, Mattel was acquitted and was even allowed to keep the pelt and trophy. And in this way, it seems that boundless bears and other creatures without a permanent, permanent address and without easily recognizable fur will often find themselves beyond the law as strange outlaws whose rights are on nobody's mind and who many people manage not to think the least bit about. But maybe the meltdown of the Arctic can suddenly make the ice melt under the feet of these traditionalists. And maybe the new thin ice will in the end be too thin to carry those weighty arguments about two roles from the deepest within and from the furthest back in history. In a time of thawing, where depth is suddenly something one can drown in, there may even be other bears than me who can see the advantage <coughs> of going out of the depths of their minds and of history to stay on the surface of things. At this moment, where the once so frozen forms are suddenly subject to enormous thawing, it may be the time, be time to tip the balance and keep one's snout above water with more lightweight interpretations of Dostoevsky and his inner bear. One interpretation, for instance, in, one interpretation, for instance could be an interpretation where one tries to set oneself the task to read the original quote that got beasts like me stuck in the head in the first place in the way it looks to, to you rather than the way it really sounds. In other words, to read Dostoevsky's original Cyrillic thought experiment about white bears as if it were Latin letters. In such a meltdown of East and West, of source and translation, one may possibly be able to read about a deep bear that is originally from within, but who can suddenly see the advantages of skating lightly across the surface. A new kind of bear with a superficial perspective on things, who will no longer roar against common words for people, against changing bears, and against equality before the law. So, let us now try this linguistic experiment. experiment. As you may recall, the real original Russian quote sounds something like this. Попробуйте задать себе задачу. Не вспоминайте о белом медведе. И увидите, что он проклятый. Будет поминутно припоминаться. In a shallow kind of Latin reading, this will sound like this, this, that will sound like this. Non porbinde tradat sebe tradahi. He was so honest for all ben o medbede. En ubente het to o nem pachete ben. Budet nem chuto nem brasbrose. Now I hope that you will all roar along with me in this superficial interpretation of Dostoevsky and that you will hope with me that this lightweight reading of the deep and heavy inner beast can make it so shallow that humanity and equality will no, no, no longer drown in its depths. Let us first start hoping, one word at a time, and after that we can perhaps share the whole big hope together in one big roar. So please say with me, Nun po pinte. Sebe. Tradahi. Tradahi. He. He. Poso omst. Poso omst.
O Ben Amebre. O Ben Amebre. An Ubenta. An Ubenta. Hatu O. Hatu O. Nam Pachstaben. Nam Pachstaben. Nam Ruto. Nam Pachon Hatsbosse. Nam Okay, now we say it all together. Nun po binte, tradat, sebe, tradari. He boso omstra, o berum medbede. En ymte, for to o, nam pakken sebe. Bude, nam ruto, nam hamagratsbosse. Thank you.